So Frank, uh, for his 40th birthday, this was in between girlfriends for him. So he, he, uh, didn't have anyone to plan a surprise party. So he planned his own 40th birthday party, invited us all down to Florida. And it was a hell of a party. It was a lot of fun. Um, but as 40th birthday parties go, uh, we were feeding Frank lots of shots and delicious drinks the whole night. Um, and uh, Frank probably should have had a little bit more food in his stomach, but he was pretty loopy. And he came over to me and said, hey, uh, I was drunk as hell. Should I give a speech? And he's slurring all over. And he's like, I never see Frank out of control. Unlike me, I'm always out of control when we go out. And uh, I'm like, you have to give a speech. But I know for a fact it's going to go bad because he can barely talk to me and stand up. And he's like, really? I'm like, you will regret it the rest of your life if you don't get up there and give a pitch. And the only time I've ever seen Frank bomb a pitch in my life was this moment. And the only reason is it would have been awesome, actually, if it would have been like a six minute pitch. But it ended up being like an hour long of Frank just <laughs> throwing it on and on up in front of everyone. And it's still one of the highlights of my entire life that I was able to persuade Frank to get up there and give a pitch against his better thinking, even in a drunken stupor. Um, but the whole reason the pitch wasn't good uh, was because it was too long. It wasn't that the material wasn't great. It was actually really good material. It was just too long. You're listening to Let Me Speak to a Manager with Frank Cava and Ian Matthews. What a crack of shit. Yeah, that was a uh, hot mic, Sam. You can't say God here. Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Frankie! Ian, you son of a bee! Why didn't you cuss at me today? You, you, uh, you turn over a new leaf. You've been going to church. No, I think you're still an asshole. But in case we ever use this as a marketing video or something to actually teach people, I figured I'd leave cursing out. I was thinking ahead, but you are yourself and your normal nature and you deserve to be cursed at. So I'm glad go. that you see uh, bitch as a uh, curse word, but not asshole. So that's I think that's important for our folks to, to see. Yeah, I was going to leave it out, but... So we are we are talking about bad presentations today, Frank. Uh, So Frank and I, both of us in the past two weeks have been um, we've been watching and actively presenting uh, for me, uh, our um, our technology startup. uh, We were one of 20 finalists for TechCrunch. Uh, disrupt, which is a pitch competition. So we spent the better part of a month putting together a persuasive presentation. And Frank was at his mastermind, which he goes to quarterly. So uh, the way a mastermind set up, Frank, maybe say how many different pitches you see in a week for a mastermind. So over the course of the week, we see each individual um, facilitator will see up to 20 presentations, most of which are done in like seven minutes or less. And it shows because they're just not great and not well thought through. But then we have a Tuesday day where there's three main presentations. Now, these are 75 minute presentations. I gave a 75 minute presentation. It took more than 50 hours to build a 75 minute presentation, just to put that in perspective for you. And then on Wednesday, we had a, um, an incredible speaker. His name is Jeff Hoffman. He's a billionaire. He invented kiosks in his twenties. So like 30 years ago, like the thing you literally use at the airport, a kiosk, he invented that. And then he invented Priceline. So this guy is like just brilliant, rich. But the thing with him is he came and did two presentations and he's been doing these presentations for like 15 years. He's the best speaker I've ever seen publicly, two best presentations I've ever seen. And this guy had these things honed in. And Ian, you'd be thrilled. He did not read from one slide. Yeah. He didn't have yeah. word. He had no words. I think we're going to get to that too. Someone who's done that is, is a little bit like a stand-up comedian. They start in the smallest clubs they can. They practice their lines and they get their timing down so well over time that they know exactly what jokes are going to hit, what's going to, what, what questions will be asked from the audience. Cause they've just, they've rehearsed so much, which is a big reason why people um, struggle to get comfortable is because they don't practice it enough. It's a, it's a complete it, it, it's a completely different thing when you gave the same pitch or the same presentation over and over. And I present in front of an audience of two to 400 people roughly two times a year. 
And it's always the first time I've given the presentation. It's hard. It takes forever to build it. You yeah. don't know what's going to work. You don't know it isn't. You can't stress test it. You can't audience test it. And professional speakers, like if you get to the point where you get to become a professional speaker, it's incredible because you know how to play the audience. So we're going to talk today about um, all the reasons why your presentation sucks. And we're going to really kind of dive into all of the the presentations, public speaking pitches we've seen that we just felt like fell flat, the things that drive us nuts when we're in the audience. Um, I'm going to start by saying one of the worst uh, presentations I ever saw. So uh, this was nearly 20 years ago. This was when I was at GE. I was a new manager and we had a big divide between sales and operations at the time. And we had this new uh, senior vice president who came in and he came up through operations. And he was known to just be a jerk to the sales team. But the problem was he was trying to act like, he was trying to act like, hey, we need to be one team. I think the name of this, they, they had a theme for this whole three-day annual meeting was better together, you know, one team, all these themes, posters, signs, all the bullshit you get in corporate. So he leads and he's dry as hell. So I could almost deconstruct his entire presentation because it was awful. So he, he does the keynote to kick off this week. And he starts by saying, you know, 2001 was a tale of two cities. Operationally, we were fantastic. On the sales front, we missed by 12%. So he leads by crushing the sales force and making it seem like operations was great. When really our view in the sales department, we'd have sold a lot more if we weren't screwing up so many of our, our deals. But he immediately lost half the room. Like it was, it was almost, it became almost like when you see us, um, uh, a president get up and half of Congress stands up and claps when he says something and the other just sits there looking mean. That's literally what happened, but he was dry. He read from his slides for 30 minutes. He didn't really know his material because he had to keep going back to it. Didn't connect with anyone in the audience and he was awkward. And it set the tone for a week of meetings that ended up being really lousy, all because this guy, in my opinion, didn't spend enough time knowing the audience, caring about connecting the audience, and thinking through all of the items in a good persuasive pitch. The other thing he didn't do a good job at is he might not be a public speaker. He put himself on stage and he was a terrible public speaker. He should have picked somebody else. Um, yeah, it's, I was at a presentation, um, city of Richmond put it on. I don't know if it's the worst I've ever seen, but it was the one where I knew the meeting was not going to be productive. Um, they went on stage and they were working on something on affordable housing and the first thing the person talked about is he turned it into a race discussion and it just ended, it put this incredible heaviness over the meeting and everybody was guarded and nobody felt like they could like speak freely anymore. And like, you could just feel the, like the air was let out of the room because we were here to solve a problem and another problem that's certainly relevant uh, or certainly is a problem was brought up, but it wasn't the problem we were coming to solve. And what it did is it took everybody's enthusiasm to appear to a place of, I don't know if I can actually help any of this and I'm defensive. So you, you neutralize the entire meeting with leading with this. So, so knowing the audience is big, understanding what you want to achieve is huge. Like one of the things that Ian and I talked about in prepping for this is like knowing where you want to end is big. The other thing is like we built an agenda. We were getting ready to hit record and we scrapped it. And the reason we scrapped it is we're like, it isn't us. And we changed the tune to what we're going to talk about and how your presentation sucks. Cause it's more on brand with us. It, it fits us. When I give good presentations, they fit me. They, I know my audience. It fits who I am. It's in my vernacular. It's in my area of strength, in my area of understanding. And I deliver a great presentation. If I get away from that, or if I see people who get away from it, those are when the presentations typically suck. So let's get right into these. Uh, number one reason your presentation sucks. You are not comfortable. And the reason why this is very important, in my opinion, if you've ever seen someone up on a stage, up in front of a group that is clearly not comfortable, 
either with their material or presenting in general or with the audience. If you're not comfortable, I can't be comfortable. If I, if I feel like you are so uncomfortable up there, I feel uncomfortable for you. And when you make me feel uncomfortable, I just want you to get off stage. I can't wait for it to end. I, I, I'm not looking forward to the next thing you say. I, I start by feeling bad for you, but by the end of it, I'm just irritated that you're still up there making me feel uncomfortable. Um, and I think there's, I think there's a lot of reasons why people can't get themselves comfortable. I think this is normal. This isn't, this isn't picking on people like this, but the truth is if you can't get comfortable getting up there, your audience is not going to like it no matter what. And, and you have to come to grips with that of figuring out ways that you can make yourself comfortable going up in front of a group of people. You referenced something a minute ago about stand-up comedians, right? And one of my all-time favorite stand-up comedians is George Carlin. I never got to see him live in a club, but I, I've seen him a hundred times on television. I've listened to him on albums. He's awesome. One of my friends told me the funniest story. Lee was in DC. George Carlin was out. George Carlin walked out in front of the audience. Everyone clapped. He had a huge book. He walked out with two stools. He sat down on one of the stools. He set this huge book on the other stool. And he looked at the audience and said, I'm going to read jokes out of this. It's going to be better for everybody. And he just went to it. And my friend said it wasn't like an HBO special. It ultimately became an HBO special. Yeah. But George Carlin was a pro. And what George Carlin knew is he didn't have command of the material yet. And he couldn't deliver it the way he was going to deliver it at the end. He was honest. He told the audience, I'm going to read it out of this because I'm fucking George Carlin and I can, and it's going to be better for you if I do it. So if you are a bad presenter and are forced to present, change this, the frame so you can succeed. Pull a George Carlin, read, do what fits you or get out of it. Like we had a president <laughs> come to our mastermind group and they were supposed to be our keynote and they didn't tell us we have terrible platform skills and we did a bad job. We didn't look at video of them they had an opportunity to just crush this event and they missed it because their platform skills sucked. But if they had told us, hey, we're not great on stage, we'd be do better with an interview or something else. You can set it up to win. So unless you must get in front of stage and you must present, figure out how you can be comfortable, do your job and convey a message that actually adds value because you are going to ultimately lose to someone's cell phone. If not, they're going to pick up their phone. They're going to get distracted. And they're going to be pissed. They had to sit there and waste this much time listening to something with no value. It's interesting, Frank, um, you know, out of the 20, um, tech startups that pitched at TechCrunch Disrupt, I'd say four or five of them had um, someone other than the founder pitch. And, you know, you think about this, these are, these are really smart people that are founding tech companies. I mean, the disruptive technologies that are changing the world kind of stuff. So PhD engineers as the founder, um, they're not polished salespeople. They're not polished presenters, they're passionate about their product, but you could tell the ones that just weren't comfortable being in front of a camera and their pitch didn't go so well. And, they, and, and I know they practiced, I know they did everything they could, but they weren't the right person for their company to represent on there because that's just not a skill set they could get comfortable with. So I like something you said, it's, oh, if you're not the right person to talk up there, find someone who is, raise your hand and say, you know what, probably not for me, probably not for me to do. Um, now you might, you might have that choice. You know, let, let's say your manager said, Hey, look, you're doing this. This is, this is what you're doing. So what I would say in that regard is know your material, know it better than anyone else that's in that audience. Because if you're the one being asked to talk on it, you should know it. So study your ass off, rehearse it a million times, right? Frank just said he spent 50 hours preparing for a 75 minute presentation. That's my style too. We did a pitch. It was a six minute pitch, Frank, and we spent a month preparing for it. And yep. I've been and the stakes were super high for you guys. Like we could be millions like, of people that could see that. That's that's it's the biggest you know tech conference in the world, and it's it's watched globally. So David did that pitch twenty five times. We practiced the tech demo over and over and over until he just had it locked down where he could do it. And by the time he pitched it, he was so comfortable because you know, he, we had just practiced. So 
the, the, from the first time we did it, we did a dry run with TechCrunch. He was uncomfortable because he had, he didn't know his materials well yet. And he was still tweaking it on the fly. So I think, I think that's important to know that you, if you're not comfortable, I find that often it's just because I haven't rehearsed it enough. Well, you have great platform skills and some people don't. So the takeaway here, if you're not comfortable is either figure out how to get comfortable or change the frame. So you can be, if you must present like you're in high school or college and you can't outsource it, figure out how you do well, sitting down might work, doing other things. And if you, what I have learned in a presentation is look, one of the things that I do in a presentation is I try and get command of the audience early. I try and get a laugh because I've been doing presentations since I was in my twenties and in my twenties and my early thirties, I would get nervous. So what I would do is I get a laugh from the audience. I'd say something funny. It is a quick break. I can shut my microphone off. I can catch a breath and then I can get back. So that's how I would get comfortable. But think about how you get comfortable. The other thing is just literally be blunt. I suck on stage. So I'm going to sit and do this because I want to be impactful for you. Like if you get on stage in front of a group and you say you're not the best presenter, but I'm going to do it this way to give you value, you're going to gain empathy. So there's a way you can play the audience. You got, we're going to get into knowing the audience in a minute, but play the audience to your, to your favor and try and win them over. Yeah. I'm not the greatest presenter, but I was chosen because I have some expertise that I think could help all of you. So uh, excuse me if I'm not the most polished guy up here, but I promise you, I have some ideas that you will use. Say that right out of the gate. And you, got my atten- here- you got my attention. And I'm going to be here till Thursday. I'm great with a cocktail. Come find me afterwards. Let's have a conversation about this. I would love to help you if I didn't do a good enough job on stage, but I'm forced to be here. So let me get through this. Yep. Number two on why your presentation sucks. You don't know your audience and it's clear to all of us. Um, So I started with the guy who did the tale of two cities, two thirds of that room were salespeople. And here he is crapping on the sales team and he lost us for three days. That was and not it. only that, he used a tale of two cities, which is a shitty book from 150 years ago. Yes. Yes. Um, so, you know, he didn't, he didn't know his audience that day, but I, I see people do this all the time where they, um, they misjudge who they're going to talk to you. You have to know who you're talking to. What, where are they in their journey? Where are they? Why are they struggling with something that you've already figured out? It, if they're not struggling with something that you figured out, you probably shouldn't be talking. You probably shouldn't be up there talking to them. If you don't have some expertise, if you haven't gone through some journey from failure to iteration to success, and they're at the beginning of that mountain, then what are you doing talking to them? You're just guessing. You're, you're, you're re-quoting a bunch of uh, half-ass internet research and, and books that you've read you don't really belong up in front of them in the first place. So you probably were chosen because you've scaled that mountain and someone knows you have, and they've asked you to talk to them. So you have to think about where is my audience in that journey? What's their backgrounds? What are these people facing with? And what, what preconceived notions might they have of this topic and of, of me as a presenter? So let me kind of go through something the, the, the the topic here is you don't know your audience. Let me come out of the gate with something profound. Nobody cares about you. They care about themselves. If they're forced to sit in front of you, or even if they're, I mean, if they're paying to sit in front of you, usually you're pretty good. You've got a track record, but this is probably not who we're talking to here. We're talking to people who have to present in front of a group. They don't care about anything that you say. They care about themselves. So if you relate it to them, If you talk about what Ian and I are good at is using stories and topics and funny anecdotes, and we use them to connect the point to the audience. We usually want to talk about either pain or pleasure, and then we drive towards the pain or the pleasure in the story. And the reason that we talk about these things is because we think they're relevant for the, for the mass, for the group that we're talking to. And it's very hard to compel to everyone, but if you can get the majority or the super majority, you get 75, 80% of the room, you're winning. So talk about topics that are consumable, relatable. The people who don't relate, Ian's 
the story, what he talked about, someone who gets on stage and he's just super dry, someone who uses nothing but statistics, someone who like you're talking to an artsy crowd and you're using specific stuff. You, you, you have to relate the message. Here's where I think this could, we could turn this into something funny. American Express ran an ad for years. Jerry Seinfeld is in front of a British audience and he's giving American jokes. He's talking about baseball and stuff and he bombs. And it's Jerry Seinfeld. So then he runs around Britain and he's using his American Express card, having all these different experiences. Then he gets back on stage. He's got on completely different clothes. He looks like, you know, a golfer from the 1800s. He's using all these different examples and then talking about baseball. He's talking about cricket. He's doing all these things. And the audience is laughing because he took what he it's the same jokes. It's a different context. And he connected. I love it. I love it. And it's I'll I'll do one more example on this, Frank. You saw a number of my presentations that I did uh, when I was with our mortgage company for home building. But uh, one thing I don't even think I ever told you this, it was like my first month with the company. Like I had just moved from Chicago and um, I saw our president um, who, you know, I love, but wasn't the greatest presenter right up in front of the home builder. And they were disgruntled. They didn't like us. Like you knew they couldn't stand the mortgage company. And what did he do? He got up and talked about how much profit we made the year before and how our margins were growing. So this is a group of people that were pissed off about how shitty our rates were. And they were shitty. They were high, they were (laughs) overpriced. And here he is bragging about how our margins just keep growing. And all they're thinking is, yeah, of course they're growing. They're growing because you're understaffed. You won't add enough people to support us. Our customers are pissed. He didn't put one slide up there on customer service. And I just sat in the audience thinking he lost them in the first slide when he talked about how much profit we had. And it was a 20 minute pitch. And when he was done, there was no clapping. There was just a bunch of grumpy faces, people with their arms crossed. And I was like, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to get up in front. It was, he had no idea how much the audience disliked his company. And he went on to prove why in that pitch. And it really, it resonated with me of, damn, you got to know the people you're in front of before you start creating your slides. I was at a, I was at a conference. Someone got on stage and he talked about the audience and these, these were people who paid him and he went and put basically a price tag on everyone's head. It was, it was unbelievable. And the next 12 months, the cancellation rate was astronomical because the audience was forgotten. They were commoditized and they weren't treated special. They felt the exact opposite. T- tell the story again about um, our chairman getting up in front of a group of people to make uh, $70,000 and complaining that he had to fly uh, first class instead of on his private jet. <laughs> I, don't re- I don't remember that story. I remember the story where our chairman was literally bitching to us that he was going to have to get home late because he had to go to a Monday night football game. He was going to fly in a private jet, sit in an owner's box, get in the locker room. Oh, that, well, that was it. That was it. He was yeah, talking talk, about something that like 1% of 1% of 1% could ever have a chance. All of do. us would have plopped down thousands of dollars for the opportunity to do what he didn't want to do. Like, he's like, well, you know, I got to fly to Philly tonight. I'm like, oh, you're going to Dulles? No, we're going to the private airport. You know, they're going to have cheesesteaks there. But, you know, you know, Joe, this is when Joe Gibbs was the coach of the, the, the Washington football team. You know, Joe we don't know Joe. He talks a lot. Like he's bitching about all this stuff. That's a dream. And for all of us, like it's completely unattainable. And it's one of the things that you realize presentations can be from stage, but presentations can also be on your way to the bathroom or the water cooler. And you can be talking to someone in your office and you could lose them as an audience because you don't talk to them like they need to be talked to. You, you, you have one talk track and you're on it versus being relatable. So uh, problem uh, number three with your presentation and why it sucks, you're focused on the wrong problem. So I, I just gave that example of a mortgage president talking about how profitable they were, which is a great presentation that I, you know what happened with that, Frank? It was a slide deck he used to present to the board. And if you're presenting to the board of directors and shareholders, 
they're clapping. Wow, that's really great. Look at your profits. Look at your margins. Everything's getting better. What really smart. That's the right problem for the board of directors to yep. show that we're growing profits. We're contributing to earnings per share in this way. But the problem when you all of a sudden change to a different audience, their problem was their customer's experience was terrible because right. he was cheap about who he hired. So our talent sucked. He wouldn't hire enough people. So we, everyone was overwhelmed and it was mismanaged. That was the problem he needed to be addressing. He needed to be talking about, here's the investments we're making. Here's how we're hiring different. Here's the people we're bringing in. He didn't talk about any of that. So he was focused on the problem of growing earnings, which that audience could care less about. That wasn't their problem. And it's, you mentioned this earlier, all they care, your audience, all they care about is themselves. They don't care about what the board cares about. They care about the pain they're going through. And what are you doing about that problem? So yesterday I had a conversation with someone from the city of Richmond and we did it over Zoom and we were having a conversation. It was a good conversation. It was going very, very, very well. And she asked me a couple of questions and I said, can I share a slide deck with you? Now I built this for bankers. I didn't build this for you. So it's not perfect, but I'm going to show you a couple of slides and then I'm going to send you an email within 48 hours and I'm going to customize this deck for you because I got to take a few things out. And I got to just change a little bit, but I'll show you a few things. So I took the presentation. Some of it was stuff that you and I built together for, our, for one of our deals. I had it in a different presentation pack. And what I did is I showed her the overview. I explained it and I said, I will customize this for you and you'll have it. And what I did is I, what, what your president could have done is taking that entire slide deck, taking out three or four slides and put three or four slides in that basically changed the frame. And it's a very similar conversation, but it starts somewhere else and it ends somewhere else, but the middle is the same. And But you know how to customize the message for the audience. So what happens in presentations is a lot of us don't get to do them again. But in my business, I have enough stuff that we talk about a lot where I have it built or I can slightly reframe it and I can use it over and over and over. The presentation I did that was 75 minutes had two of the same slides. It, it, they weren't exactly the same, but they were very close. They had the same picture and I referenced it. I said, you've already seen this picture earlier and the reason you're seeing it twice is it's a damn good slide. There's no sense in redoing it. And it's a beautiful picture. So you get to reuse these things and recapture it if you do it right. Uh I've got one more funny story on this of uh, focused on the wrong problem. So um, guy who worked for me, he was a regional manager and we were having this, um, we took a bunch of our folks that have been with our company for three months in this position. We brought them together and we were trying to help them. Um, but they were disgruntled because we did a bad job of training them. And we had hired so many people in so short a time that they weren't performing. And so Mikey goes to this um, meeting and his piece that he's going to do is on time management. So he's got a bunch of like Stephen Covey stuff and, you know, the, the old Eisenhower matrix and important, not urgent and time blocking, blah, 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 blah. And like 10 minutes into his pitch, they revolt. They're like, this isn't our problem. Like you got, we have like a hundred customers. Don't tell us this is our, and like, there were like maybe like three or four that revolted. So I'm making it seem like the whole room, but there were probably 30 people. And there were a handful, maybe five that just unloaded on him. Like you haven't hired anyone. We're losing people. I'm inheriting customers. And he, he was there to give a pitch, you know, and making it, it they took it as you're saying we're the problem that we're not organized enough that we're not good at time management. You're the problem, dude. The problem is you don't hire well, you don't hire enough, and we're all doing way too much damn work. This isn't about, you know, Eisenhower matrix. And I've, I've been making fun of him about this for like 10 years that he got booed off the stage as a vice president because people, that it just goes to show these people are all really close to quitting anyway because they would willing to just light up a vice president on a stage, but they lit him up. It was like the biggest dog of a presentation where he had to call timeout and say, okay, let's just talk. Like what, what's going on? What are you dealing with? So let's wrap this up with this. The last two points is you don't know your audience and you're focused on the wrong problem. Both of those can be summarized as tone deaf. If you're, and we all suffer from this from time to time. If you're tone deaf 
to the audience or the problem, there is absolutely no way you can give a successful presentation. Now, in olden times, you'd probably be dragged off stage and hung or shot or stabbed. Nowadays, you could lose your job. You could lose your status. You could lose the audience. People could get pissed off and either quit or no longer renew. So there's other ways that this happens, but both of them come down to you aren't properly connecting and being prepared to deliver the right message. Number four, and this one uh, is particularly galling to me, you read your entire presentation from your slides. Um, I think there's a special place in hell for people to do this. I effing hate people to do this. I want to boo. I want to throw eggs at you. If you start rolling out slides that have hundreds of words on them and you read them bullet by bullet, uh, there's just nothing lazier or more worthless in my opinion. And it's even worse when you do it virtually with zoom where you just throw it up about like, to me, if that's all your presentation is, email to us and we'll read it, write them. That's a, write a compelling memo. Um, but you shouldn't have to look at your slides. You should never, in, in my opinion, you should never have so much written up there that it is your slide, you know, a, an image, a picture, a few words, a bullet or two. Okay. But when you have to do this, you're just telling me that you didn't practice much. And you're also telling me what you're doing is you're conditioning me early, especially that I'm not going to look at you for the entire time you're up there talking. I'm going to just read your slides and take notes off your slides if I find anything in it of interest, which is highly unlikely if that's your style. But if you're not adding any stories or anecdotes, no one will look at you. And I think some people that do this, that's what they want. Like they're looking at the slides, like, look away. Don't look at me. I'm nervous. This comes back to being comfortable. Um, but damn, I cannot stand people that read their slides. So if you are someone who reads your slides, you're not a public speaker. That's all there is to it. You're probably being forced into this or, you know, you, you have a technical skill and they're saying, please share this. So you're not great at it. I have a different presentation style than Ian. Ian prefers to get something in writing and read it and process it and turn it into his own. I would prefer to listen. I don't like to read as much as he does. I don't like to do that stuff. I like to see it being done. And I like to have a lot of backup. My presentations have more words on them than Ian's, almost always. I don't read the slide. I have a ton up there. And I hit on a couple of overview points. So the most important thing is you need to be comfortable. And then you need to deliver a message that compels the audience and helps the audience. So you can choose the method that works best for you. Simply reading slides to me is not the best use. You shouldn't be presenting in the first place. But if you do your presentation in a way that, hey, it gives you comfort to have these words up there and then you can summarize it, that's fine too. So there's not necessarily, you're, you're probably not going to get paid for that speech, but those are the things that you can focus on to get yourself comfortable and compel the audience. At a minimum, there's no need for you to ever be staring at the slide. You, if you wrote it, you know what's written up there. Look at the audience. Talk to the audience. Look, make eye contact. Connect with them. There's just no reason to be staring at your slide and reading things. There's something else too. Do you know? Do you know what a confidence monitor is? No. A confidence monitor is a monitor that goes in front of the stage that you can look at. So you can look down and then you can look at the audience. You don't have to look over your shoulder the whole time at the presentation behind you. If you are not a public speaker and you do have to speak in front of an audience, ask for a confidence monitor. And if they say no, say, can I bring my laptop up and set it on a pedestal? But that way you can look and look at the audience. There's ways to win. The audience wants you to succeed. The audience wants to be better. That's yeah. the reason they're there. So figure out these little hacks that are so simple that give you an ability to not have to read, tell compelling things and let people absorb it and kind of interact. Number five reason why your presentation likely sucks. It's way too long. So um, let's start with a story on this one, Frank, um, a story of a presentation that you did that went uh, askew. Um, so Frank, uh, for his 40th birthday, this was in between girlfriends for him. So he, he, uh, didn't have anyone to plan a surprise party. So he planned his own 40th birthday party, invited us all down to Florida. And it was a hell of a party. It was a lot of fun. Um, but as 40th birthday parties go, uh, we were feeding Frank lots of shots and delicious drinks the whole night. Um, 
And uh, Frank probably should have had a little bit more food in his stomach, but he was pretty loopy. And he came over to me and said, hey, uh, I was drunk as hell. Should I give a speech? And he's slurring all over. And he's like, I never see Frank out of control. Unlike me, I'm always out of control when we go out. And uh, I'm like, you have to give a speech. But I know for a fact it's going to go bad because he can barely talk to me and stand up. And he's like, really? I'm like, you will regret it the rest of your life if you don't get up there and give a pitch. And the only time I've ever seen Frank bomb a pitch in my life was this moment. And the only reason is it would have been awesome, actually, if it would have been like a six minute pitch. But it ended up being like an hour long of Frank just (laughs) throwing it on and up in front of everyone. And it's still one of the highlights of my entire life that I was able to persuade Frank to get up there and give a pitch against his better thinking, even in a drunken stupor. Um, But the whole reason the pitch wasn't good uh, was because it was too long. It wasn't that the material wasn't great. It was actually really good material. It was just too long. Yeah. We had to call nickel and from the bullpen to save me. And he's probably giggling as he listens to this, but it was, uh, it's, it, it's one of the worst. It's one of the things I actually regret. I made an ass of myself. Um, and I also, but I learned a valuable lesson not to fucking rely on Ian in these moments, <laughs> but the point is brevity is good. In it's never a good idea to ask another really drunk guy if you're too drunk to go give a pitch. That's just a bad idea in general. Yeah. Don't ask your biggest meathead friend for advice like this because it's going <laughs> to backfire on you. <laughs> Sophomore humor. But the point is quickly to the point. Now, it, it, what was funny about this is we went to we had an incredible experience. We've talked about it. Uh, one of our investors, one of our deals owns a bunch of restaurants and he's a gracious guy. And he calls Ian up and he's like, I'm flying you and Frankie to Chicago and we're going to have this incredible night. And we ended up having an incredible night. We had like bottles and bottles of wine. He opened the restaurant just for us. This was during COVID where it was like really, really, we had to be very specific. Like we had to be really important, like really, we had to follow a lot of rules. And I was compelled to say something. And although I was a bit long, it took less than three minutes to make this speech. And I just said, basically, thank you. Now, I could have said it shorter if I was sober, but I wasn't. But the point was, I learned my lesson from that terrible birthday speech. And I just said, I, I, I'm overwhelmed with emotion and want to say thanks. And that's about it. Um, I so- think the problem, I think the problem, Frank, in mostly, you know, like in a corporate setting or at a conference, I think the problem that, most, I would say the time slot of pitches I ever saw are too long. And most things I've ever done are too long. And that's because the meeting organizer is dying for content. They charged you a thousand bucks to get in the door or they're trying to run an all day corporate meeting. And so they say, Hey, Ian, you have an hour in our meeting agenda. Cause they're trying to just fill it up. You know, that that's just the way it works. I, I my first builder meeting I ever went to Frank, I had 10 minutes on the agenda. By the time I was done six, seven years later, I had 45 minutes on the agenda and they were just trying to fill time. I knew that. And so my presentations went too long, but I was being asked to take time up. So I think part of this, the organizer makes this problem. And I, I think part of that, you can open up parts of it for Q&A. You can interact more through if you don't have enough material to expand to 45 put minutes. In, put hour. in an exercise. You can put an exercise in. You can do a couple other things. Different so- things you can do. Do you know what it's, you know what a TED talk is, right? Yeah. Okay. So TED talks are limited in time. There, there's different lengths, but they're usually about 18 minutes or less. Um, TED talks started becoming popular in the like 2008, nine, 10. You started to hear about them. They've been going on for years. They've been going on for like 30 or 40 years, but they finally yeah. started to like broadcast these and put them over the internet and people could watch them. The best story I ever heard about a TED talk and my first experience or exposure to a TED talk was Tony Robbins. I was at a Tony Robbins event in 2009 and he talked about this thing he did at a TED talk. So the TED talk was 18 minutes. And Tony Robbins walked up on stage and goes, I'm going to really struggle with this 18 minutes. My normal speech is 50 hours <laughs> and I have 18 minutes. And this thing went viral. And to me, it was the thing that compelled others to watch TED Talks because he took 50 hours worth of stuff and he gave you a brief overview in 18 minutes. And it was incredible. He told stories. He's got an incredible stage presence, been doing this for years, but he dominated those 18 minutes and he edited it down and he took it and he created something different because 
he the length of time. And I think that's why TED Talks are so incredibly valuable and popular is you know exactly how long they are and they're all under 20 minutes. I think I, I totally agree with you that t- almost every TED Talk, if you go look at the average is like 12 to 16 minutes um, because it's, it's supposed to be to the point, succinct. And I think that is a perfect time for no matter how big of material you have, to really get something through, uh, to go back to the tech crunch disrupt, you have six minutes to do, to tell everyone about your story, your team, the total available market, the problem, how you're going about solving it, how you're financed and giving a live demo. And you have six minutes to do it. And so it forces you to really, you know, hone down, carve it, whittle away until you are at the essence of everything. And by the time it was over, you're not saying, God, I wish I had two more minutes. The truth is, it's the old Mark Twain. I'm sorry to have written you a long letter. If I had more time, I'd have written a short one. It takes time to think about it. But you, through iteration, you get to just the bare minimum. You know, that's six to 15, 20 minutes. That's about all you need to really crush a really good presentation. And most are just too long. So number six reason why your presentation sucks you don't know your material well enough. And I think this is, you didn't do your homework or you're speaking about something without relative experience. And it's obvious to everyone that you're speaking theoretically. Um, I find that this is a really easy person to kind of out just by listening to them. And if you are one of the subject experts in the audience, you normally can find it out pretty fast. Yep. I mean, I I don't know if there's much to add here. It's uh, again, if you know, you don't know your material, but you're being asked to speak on something. So the best example I can give of this is a personal story. I was charismatic, relatively handsome, recently graduated from college and I had gotten promoted. Like, you know, I, I got, I moved up pretty quickly in my first 18 months and I decided within two years of me graduating from college to put me on on college campuses. And they sent me to the university of Florida And I'm in front of a group of like 30 kids and I have a slide deck that corporate made. And I look at these kids that are two years younger than me. And I look at this slide and I said, I got to be honest with you. I have absolutely no idea what this slide means. Like this was made at corporate. But what I can tell you is probably had like compound uh, Kager compound annual growth rate, you know, or something, some finance. I said this, I said, I I can't tell completely sure what's happening here, but everything's in green and things are pointing up. So it looks good to me. I'm going to go to the next slide. The room erupted with laughter. Everybody understood that I didn't know it. And I went on to something I knew and I talked about more, but I very quickly got over it because I didn't know it. Now I knew the other stuff and I was compelling, but I was honest in that moment. Now, if you don't know all of your stuff, it, it's harder. Like it, that's a great story. It, that's, that's yeah. it's just the candor that gets into something a uh, little bit later on likability that I love. Um, so number seven reason why your presentation sucks. You lost me in the first minute. So primacy effect, we remember most what we saw first, um, it matters. The first minute you walk on stage from the second we can see you coming from behind a curtain or up the steps, we're already making a decision on whether we like you and we want to listen to you or not. Um, and I see, I see most people not putting enough thought into this, not putting enough thought into connecting, not paying attention to this uh, unconscious bias that people have. Um, And it ends up ruining the whole pitch for me because I've made my mind up 30 seconds in that you're boring and I don't want to listen to you. And this is going to suck. And that's usually why you see so many people get up to take a leak two minutes into someone's pitch because they made their mind up that this is the time I've been holding it, but this is the pitch I don't need to watch anymore. So, so what's worse is when everyone's heads down. So everybody's doing this. They're looking down at their phone. Their heads are down. You're up on stage and someone's up there and they're doing it. And they're, they're in their email or they're on their phone or they're taking a leak or they're at the bar or they've gone outside. Like that's it. You've lost the audience. Now, some, I, I come back to tone deaf a lot. Like if you have lost the audience, this is Tony Robbins too. Tony Robbins makes people jump around, do all these things for constant engagement. If you look on the internet, he's always all over the place with like how he gets people engaged. If you are not a professional speaker, but you've lost your audience, be honest with it. Call it out. Hey, I seem to have lost you. I'm sorry. I have 
30 minutes to be up here. My goal is to accomplish this. Maybe let's get into Q and A. How do I like be honest, like look at the audience and if they're not paying attention to you, but most people aren't honest, they just drone on and they're just paying attention to themselves. Totally. Totally. But you can, you can change that dynamic very quickly by doing an impromptu Q and A, doing other things, making people stand up, ask a couple of questions of the audience, call someone out. There's a bunch of ways to get it back. But if you've lost the audience, if you're not honest to it, it's a waste of time for everybody. So you have to, you have to win the first minute the, the, I give, I give so much time in my mind to how I'm going to win the first minute. And Frank and I talked a little bit about this before. So here's some ways you can win the first minute. Start with a story. I love a story. I love someone who comes up and there's no slides and they just start telling a story and you're wondering where is it going to go? Start with a joke, either about yourself, about the person who introduced you, about the previous speaker's presentation, about the problem the audience is facing, um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the, the prison yard, uh, the prison yard strategy, which is, you know, if you, if I were to ever go to prison, they always tell you the first thing you should do is go punch the biggest guy. So I usually go crush the highest level vice president in the room. I'll go pick on, you know, someone, someone high up in the room and make a little joke about them. They usually like it. And the audience always loves that. You can start with a question. You can start, Frank, seeing people that aren't great pres- presenters that have nice videos. Start with a video that captures the imagination, gets the attention of people. You can do audience participation early. I used to always start my annual meeting with a skit. So we would do a cold open, just like a Saturday Night Live, where I would have three or four people who worked for me up on a stage with microphones acting out a skit for something that the whole company was going through that was humorous and fun. And it wasn't about me. It was about them. It was about the team. So my job always was to win the first minute, to get your attention and make you think, I'm going to like watching the rest of this. I can't wait to see what's next. This is not the pitch I'm going to the bathroom on. I'm going to wait and I'm going to check this out. That's it. And what will happen is you'll get a reputation of that if you're good at this over time and it, it, it propels you through your career. This was something that Ian talked about a second ago. It used to be 10 minutes and it was up to 50 minutes. I mean, I mean Ian was like, he was doing, what were we doing? 15 annual meetings by the end? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not Pretty like, much it, everyone's, yeah. Yeah, you were doing all of them. So you became you know, a sideshow or a skit that they would plop in. So getting comfortable and winning the first few minutes is critical. But I want to say the following. So I don't remember what award show it was, but Adele was up there on a, on a piano and she started off bad, bad. And it's Adele and it's live and there's millions of people watching. And what she did is she stopped and she said, I'm so nervous. I'm covering the song. This person is my hero. I have so much pressure. And I did terrible. I'm sorry. I'm going to start over. And she did. And the crowd and went the crazy end, when she said it. They went crazy because it was they like went crazy, so raw. They went crazy when she said it. And when she finished, they went nuts. So win the first few minutes. But if you know what's bomb, crazy is she felt it. Uh, you and I are not expert. Like, you're, I, it didn't I sound didn't bad to me. Screwed, didn't, I didn't know she screwed it up. Sounded good me either. Still, she's so talented. I didn't know it. But the point it mattered she, to her. She won the and she And she owned it and she said it. And when she owned it and she said it, she bought immediate credibility with the audience. And to me and Ian, it sounded the same, but to her, it was better. And everybody loved it. It's like if you ever listen to, you know, your favorite artist and they say the name of the city, they just throw the name of the city in. Hey, Cleveland, everyone goes nuts. It it, it doesn't take a lot. So what I'm saying here is if you let's just say you're not a professional speaker, you've been asked, you do it and you screw up. The first three minutes don't go the way you want. Apologize. Ask for a reset. Give yourself a chance to breathe. Shut your microphone off for 30 seconds. I need to take a quick drink of water. Do something to reset the frame. Three wasted minutes is way better than 30 wasted minutes. And the audience will give you incredible grace if you are smart enough to ask for it. I love all that. So Frank, I'm going to use an example that we did together. And I, I think this is important on this losing in the first minute. So 
even if you have an organizer of an event or the previous person before you does an incredible introduction for you and you could be so lucky like that's that's very helpful when you have someone who does a very nice introduction to build you up before you come on you still have to win the first minute so yep. um frank invited me to an event and i was there speaking on leadership uh building teams and um he did an unbelievable job. He spent 15 minutes, long, way longer than I expected him to, just talking about successes I had in my career, getting the audience excited for me to talk. And I didn't need much else than that. It was the, the audience was primed. He had them excited. Frank's a person they respect, look up to. So when he says, this is a guy I respect and look up to, I didn't need to. But instead, what I did was, even though he did all that for me, I went up there. I made two jokes about Frank. I forgot the first one, but the second one was about his skinny jeans. So I did the start with a joke about the most senior person in the room. I picked on him. Then the present presentation before me was about legacy and how to sell your company. And I didn't have this ready, but I said, I want to talk about something real quick on that previous store uh, presentation, which I thought was awesome. And I told the story about my father-in-law and how he's struggling to sell his business because he hadn't set up an organization. Same problem they went through. And then three, I told a story self-deprecating about myself. I told my Lionel Richie story ripping on myself. So I used three different things to connect with that audience, even though Frank spent that much time setting me up because he could set me up all he wanted. And if I blew the first couple of minutes, they'd be like, well, that's why he set him up so much. He's not a good presenter. So what? That's one of the I things said. that one of the things that we train on in sales is buyer's remorse. So buyer's remorse is when you don't properly set the hook and the per, you don't really get at the needs. You don't really get at the problem. And by not really get at the problem, the person then the, left to their own devices has remorse and they try and cancel. I was on the phone with somebody yesterday on basically convincing him to come work at our company. And he was a yes. And I stopped and I said, look, it sounds to me like you're ready to sign, but I need to dig a little bit deeper. I want to understand this more. When we train salespeople, I tell them they're being lazy. Like, don't be lazy. Do the extra work. Ian had it, but his fundamentals are so strong. He wasn't lazy. He took the extra initiative. He had inertia. He built more of it. Those are the things that you do in sales interactions, in interview interactions, in presentations. The fundamentals are there. So what could have happened is Ian could have just skipped it, went right into it. What Ian did is he took the momentum I gave him and he built on it. And this was a four hour presentation. This was like a big presentation. It absolutely served him for the rest of that presentation because he did the foundation right, plus the Q&A and the next day he was mobbed because he was likable. He got a good intro from me, but then he did something funny against me. Like he did all the right stuff and it turned into this monumentous event where it didn't have to be that way if he didn't do the steps. So number eight reason why your presentation sucks, you're just not likable. And likable is almost relatable as well. Um, you know, I think Frank's example with the Seinfeld commercial in London is really great where he's telling American jokes in London and he wasn't relating to his audience that well. Um, I think it's obvious when someone's trying to be someone they're not, I, I would always say lean on being yourself. It's being authentic comes through to people. Always be self-deprecating. Um, make sure that if you have reached a level of success and you probably have, if you're presenting, if someone's asked you to present you've been successful at something in some field. Um, so if that's the case, make sure they always know that it wasn't always the case. You weren't born successful. There was a time, I think, I think the just like me presenter is the best. I think that's the one that grabs me the most is the one that says, you, you know, it's the rock saying, uh, you know, when I got cut from the Canadian football league. I had $7 in my pocket. He loves to tell the story. He built a company called $7 productions. That's he tells that story all the time because he wants all of his followers to know I was broke. I was thinking of killing myself. I was depressed. I didn't know where I was going in my life. And I was like 25 when this happened. And, you know, it, I needed some breaks, but I had to work. He loves to do that. So relate in some way 
be positive, be uplifting, be all those things. Yes. But relate to the audience that you understand the place they're at in their life. It, I, I'm going to say the same thing I've said three or four times. If you aren't relatable, if you aren't likable, talk about it. Just be honest. I suck on stage. I'm not terribly likable up here. Like, just be honest. It's amazing if you embrace honesty, the grace. That's likable. And Someone inertia. admitting it, something it, like that. I, yeah. think, I think what you're saying there is be candid. Like, be honest yeah. with what you're going through up there. People will relate to that. Like, yeah, I don't like getting up there either. That's why I'm in the I, I, I hope to add value, but I hate being on stage. So I'm going to probably fumble this. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to keep it short. If that's true, like, that relates to more of the audience than less because they're in the it. audience for a reason and not presenting for a reason. That's it. So either learn your audience, know your audience, do all the steps we talked about a second ago, like Ian did it in the intro, or own the fact that you don't belong on that stage. I know I don't belong up here. I don't really feel comfortable up here. I'm sorry I'm going to be up here. I'm going to go quick. I'm going to try and add value, and then I'll be at the bar where I'm more comfortable. Come talk to me. Like If you do that, you own it. Yep. Number nine, um, you have the wrong solution or no solution at all. So for me, this is where the hero's journey comes in. Uh, hero's journey, it's in almost every American movie you've ever seen. You may just not know it. Um, think Star Wars, um, you know, almost, almost actually every character in the Star Wars uh, trilogy goes through the hero's journey where they're in one place. They've, you know, they, they grind, they go through this terrible stress and uh, strife, and then they find some little eureka moment, they change, they become someone different and they find success. Um, so the hero's journey, you know, if people are struggling and you know their problem and you had that same problem at some point, talk about what that solution was for you and how that solution helped you break through to the success you have today. That's, I think that's the only thing in my mind when I think of the solution and I'm talking, hey, here's a problem, here's a solution. So let's just take Let's take keep and this, this connected car alarm and platform we have. So David talked about the problem. People kept breaking into my car. I went to Amazon. I went and Googled and I found the same old crappy car alarm solutions. Then I invented keep now keep keeps me safe. It keeps me protected. So it's got its own hero arc journey, even though we don't even have the product yet. So come up with a solution that actually solves problems of the people in the audience. That's it. That's it. And if, if you're unclear on what the problems of the audience are, if it's not, you know, you're not building a product, ask, Hey, there's microphones on either side. What is it about this problem that you want my help with? Like just being honest and not trying to fake it. Like I'm not someone who feels comfortable faking it. And I feel the most authentic when I can just be myself and real. And I encourage that of you because audiences react positively. Love it. And num number 10, it doesn't matter what you're presenting. If you're a salesperson giving a pitch, if you are an executive trying to motivate and inspire a company to change, all of this is the same. The whole point of a presentation is to convince a group of people to act, to break from the status quo in some way. So number 10 reason why your presentation sucks, you left me with nothing compelling to go act on when I left. And I know that's a big one for Frank, especially at masterminds, because you're speaking to people as an authority figure, as someone who's seen some relative level of success they have not seen. And your whole job to give value, these are paying customers in front of you, is to convince them to go act so that their life changes in a better way. That's it. You either need to give them something compelling to act on, or they need something to remember that compels them. So what this is kind of not tangential, but I'm going to use it anyways. My business was built on postcards. I sent postcards in the mail in the 21st century and it built my business. And on every postcard on the front, it was written twice. And on the back, it was three times. It was bold and it was underlined. Any guesses of what it was? No. A phone number. There was a call to action and a phone number. And it was five times on every single postcard. And the reason was, is I was sending this to you because I wanted you to call me. 
I never lost sight of the action. The action was, I wanted you to call. And it was through a simple, stupid postcard. And it was written five times on a three by five card because I never, you don't need to get too fancy, stick with it, stay with it. Same thing in a, in a presentation, no matter how small or how big, understand what the call to action is. What do you want to compel people to? And it's kind of like the eulogy. If you've ever heard the story, if you write your eulogy and you think about what you want people to say about you when you're dead and you live your life that way, you will get to your eulogy. For me, a presentation starts at the end. What do I want to leave you with? What do I want you to take away? What do I want you to remember? And I work through a thesis statement and through presentation and through story and through engagement to get you to a point where that is what you are. It's absolutely 100% clear what my purpose was. I love it. Um, our, our, something you just said is very compelling. So our, our tech crunch pitch, the, the very last thing that David says at the end, go to keep.tech, our website. We are offering 100 um, free night devices. It's a $300 value for the first people to sign up on our waiting list. And we'll be doing that on November 1st. That little piece right there, go to our website, sign up, no, no money, and you could win one of these devices. With, an, expir- thing got with, us an, expir- a bunch of with an expiration date. An expiration that's, date. So it's a compelling it. reason to act. And he finished his pitch with that, even though it was a pitch competition, we still were trying to get people to go sign up to follow our wait list. And it's a compelling reason to act. And hopefully we've been compelling enough that it's a good product. If you like what we had to say, go try to win a free one. So for those of you that found value, please like us, thumb this up, follow, oh, subscribe, oh, ask friends. Up. And look not only up. that, not only that, if you are afraid to give a presentation, do it. Set a goal, set a date, get in front of people, do it and practice. I'll leave you with this. Warren Buffett, one of the richest people in the history of the world, says the thing that was the most valuable in his life was going to a speaking class where he literally had to learn how to give public speeches in front of an audience. It forced him and compelled him to do this. Now he did it in the 1950s and late fifties, early sixties. He's lived to 90. So he's had 70 good years to practice, but it is the thing that has changed him from a smart, successful investor to one of the icons in business because he got comfortable in front of a crowd and could deliver a compelling message. I love it. I love it. And if we've changed your life in any way today, go to Apple Podcasts, give us a five-star review, write some nice comments, and tell as many of your friends about this episode who you know have to get in front of groups on a regular basis because it has just delivered such dynamic value to you. Frank, it's been great hanging out with you. Always a pleasure, brother. See you, dude. See ya. 